It's a great pleasure for me to be at Georgetown. We lived in Washington for two years when I was the diplomatic correspondent of Newsweek covering the State Department, and we know what an outstanding university Georgetown is. Everybody hear me all right? Okay. I want to take you back to the France of 1942, one of the darker periods of the nation's history. The country is divided roughly in half, with the northern half occupied by German forces and the southern half run by a French government at Vichy, which is uh, collaborating with the Germans. The armed French resistance is relatively small. Most Frenchmen are cooperating with the Germans and Vichy, indifferent to the, deep, the mass deportation of Jews to the death camps. Such is the historic record, but it is far from the whole story. The rest of the story, which is less well known, is just the opposite. It is, in, in a word, heroic. It involves a significant minority of French men and women, all of them unarmed civilians who refuse to cooperate with the authorities and instead risk their lives to help save Jews. My book is about their extraordinary courage. I want to start with a young Jewish couple, Indies, in 1942. And let me read a brief passage to open this. He was a graduate student, she just out of medical school. Together, the young Jewish couple in German-occupied France had nothing, no money, no influence, no protection. For Musa Abadi, an immigrant from Syria, and Odette Rosenstock, his French companion, transport meant a borrowed bicycle. A meal was often only a hard-boiled egg, and a shared cigarette was a luxury. And of course, as all Jews, the threat of the gas chambers hung over their heads. And yet, improbably, these two people stood up against Nazi atrocities. At the risk of their lives, they dedicated themselves to saving Jewish children from the gas chambers. Musa Abadi was only 33 and his future wife 28 when they formed the Marcel Network to hide children in Catholic convents and boarding schools or with Protestant families. Their clandestine network became one of the most successful operations of Jewish resistance anywhere in Europe. Musa and Odette admitted that the odds were overwhelmingly against them, and still they persevered. Armed only with courage, brains, and a moral compass, they defied one of the most brutal dictatorships in history to save 527 young lives. As an example, of what only two people of goodwill can accomplish when confronted with crimes against humanity, their story is a lesson for all time. So what made them do it? Musa himself described two key incidents that motivated them to act. In the first, he came upon a scene in Nice that took his breath away. A young woman lay in the street covered in blood as a French policeman stomped on her head with his heavy boot. A small crowd had gathered around to watch the woman die. Nearby, the woman's sister stood, holding the hand of the victim's six-year-old son. Mama, mama, the little boy kept crying. Nobody dared intervene. What's happening? An incredulous Musa asked. Can't you see, said a man in the crowd, he's disciplining a Jew. Musa was so upset, he, he turned horrified and walked away, so upset that he cried out in the street, God, why have you abandoned us? Excuse me. Musa could not, could not forget that little boy. He kept wondering what would happen to him. Tomorrow the little boy might be arrested. 
That was the day, Musa said, I decided I would not sit idly by and watch the parade. I was going to do something. Okay. <laughs> I was going to do something. I didn't know what, but Odette and I were going to help. The second incident convinced Musa that time was running out. A rescue operation for Jewish children had to be organized without delay. In the second incident, Musa met with an Italian priest just back from the Soviet front, Father Penitenti. The priest told Musa that he had seen German soldiers in the Ukraine line 20 Jewish children up against the wall and massacre them with machine guns. He also said that he had seen German troops or order Jewish children to run, only to take up their rifles and fire at the fleeing children in a macabre shooting contest in which the best shot won beer money for the most kills. I don't believe you, Musa said. Barbarity has its limits. So Father Penitenti opened his cassock, took out a wooden crucifix, and said, I swear to you by the blood of Christ that everything I have said is the truth. And Musa's doubts collapsed. He and Odette agreed that the same thing might soon happen in Nice if the Germans took over the city. And he said uh, that on that very day, Odette and I decided we were going to do something urgently. At the time that uh, Musa met with Penitenti, the Vichy government was arresting only foreign-born Jews, a relatively uh, restricted operation. But all that changed in September 1943, when the Germans themselves occupied Nice and began the mass arrests of French Jews. So in effect, Musa and Odette had only three months to prepare before the Germans marched in. So how did they do it and what did they do? Well, the answer is they did it with the help of equally brave, unarmed civilians that they recruited and organized into a network. First among them was Paul Raymond, the Catholic Bishop of Nice, who defied not only the Nazis and Vichy, but also his Pope, Pius XII. Under papal orders, the French clergy were obliged to cooperate with the Germans and with Vichy, and generally did so. But Paul Ramon believed that he had a higher duty to God. The bishop enabled the Abadis to save some 300 children by hiding them in convents and Catholic boarding schools. Next came two Protestant pastors who helped hide some 200 others with Protestant families. Pastor Pierre Gagné, who was fluent in, in German, had the courage to walk into Gestapo headquarters in Nice and demand the release of prisoners, sometimes successfully. And Pastor Edmond Evrard allowed Jews on the run to hold secret religious services in his Baptist church. So the Marcel network was truly an interfaith operation, two Jews running an operation involving many Catholic and Protestant uh, members, supporters, and every one of them, every single one of them, from the nuns in the convents to the Protestant for foster families, every one of them constantly risked arrest and the death penalty. And indeed, two women who worked for the Abadis paid for it with their lives. The man who raised the money for the Abadis uh, and, and smuggled it in from Switzerland showed another kind of courage. Uh, Maurice Brenner, uh, in his spare time, was a, was a spy for the forerunner of the CIA, and yet incredibly for a man of such action. His legs were crippled by childhood polio, and he could hardly walk. 
Last but hardly least, the courage of the hidden children themselves was phenomenal well before the Abadis took them in. Julian Engel was nine years old and his brother George four when they said goodbye to their parents for the last time. They could not kiss or hug each other. All they could do was touch hands through a barbed wire fence. The last thing Julian heard his parents tell him was, take care of your little brother. The parents eventually died at Auschwitz. The boys survived by a miracle. Mart Ardstein, alone on Paris streets, escaped all by herself from the Gestapo agents and French police hunting her down. She was eight years old. Armand Morgenstern talked his way off a German death train when he was 10. Eventually, the Engel brothers, Mart and Armand, were all saved by the Abadis. And we are fortunate to have Julian Engel with us here today. And sometime later, he will be able to tell you more about his extraordinary story. Hiding the children was just the beginning. They had to be fed and clothed, given false documents in non-Jewish names, and taught to assume their new identities. And this was far from easy. I'd like to read you a second brief passage about that. Musa called the process depersonalization, the naming, the training of the youngsters to forget who they were and become someone else. Before being hidden, they would have to learn new Christian names for themselves and their parents, new places of birth, and hardest of all, they would have to say their parents were dead. Some feared just saying that could somehow make it so. In the typical cover story, the child would have to learn that he or she was born into a Christian family in a French colony like Algeria or Morocco, places where the German occupiers could not check their birth records. The parents had supposedly died, perhaps in a bombing raid during the Allied landing in North Africa, the reason the child had been sent to France, to a convent or boarding school, or to live with a foster family. Odette recounted one depersonalization session she conducted with a small boy, demonstrating how difficult the process could be. Your name is no longer Smoilovich, she told the boy. It's Dupont. That's what your papers say, so repeat after me. Dupont. Dupont. Good. Again. Dupont. Dupont. One more time. What is your name? Dupont. Very good. You may leave. The boy turned and walked away. Oh, Smoilovich, Odette called out. Without thinking, the boy responded to his real name by turning back toward Odette. Odette sighed. They would have to start again. What is your name? I can't do this, he told Odette. How are my parents going to find me after the war if I have a new name? They will, but for now you must answer to Dupont. Dupont. Repeat, what is your name? Dupont. Again, Dupont. <laughs> In hiding, the children faced further traumas, bravely living with strangers and terrified for themselves and their parents. Often their only comf comfort was the monthly visits they got from Odette, their surrogate mother. She held them in her arms and cuddled them. The Marcel network nearly collapsed when Odette was arrested. Her account of the year that she survived at Auschwitz is the most gripping example of personal courage in the book. Musa had to carry on without her escaping arrest himself by a whisker. The success of the Marcel network also depended on ordinary Frenchmen making unexpected contributions. There was the French school teacher in Lyon who warned the Jewish children in his class that they should tell their parents they, the families had to leave the city immediately because the Germans were planning mass roundups in the next few days or the peasant woman in the mountains who asked the Abadis to give her their ugliest, 
most unwanted child and promised to love it as her own. By the end of the war, a quarter of the 300,000 uh, 300, Jews in France had perished, one quarter. But three quarters survived, one of the higher survival figures in Europe. And they did so because in most cases, at least one French Christian took a risk to help. So France has some reason to be proud of its record. The sins of Vichy did not tar everyone. In fact, my book helps to disprove three myths about the Holocaust years in France. The first myth is that the Jews marched like lemmings to the gas chambers. This is not true. Jews in France organized and financed unarmed resistance units to save their own people. The Marcel network was but one example of this, the largest one in the south of France. The second myth was that individual French Christians did nothing to help the Jews because of their long history of anti-Semitism. Now it is true that for centuries, the French were taught that the Jews killed Christ, and there is no doubt that anti-Semitism played a role in Vichy's cooperation with the Nazis. But as the book makes clear, other French Christians played a vital role in saving Jews. The third myth is that because of the attitude of Pope Pius XII, the Catholic Church hierarchy in France did not help the Jews. Again, not true, or at least not entirely true. The controversy over Pius XII continues to this day. For most of the war, he stood silent in the face of Nazi atrocities against the Jews. Allied diplomats and Jewish leaders continually implored him to exercise his moral authorities and his moral authority, and to speak out in public against the mass deportation to the gas chambers. But Pius XII refused, often arguing that the Vatican had to remain neutral during the war. The current pope, Benedict XVI, has proposed sainthood for Pius XII on the grounds that the wartime pope did far more for the Jews in private than is generally known. And that may very well be true. But the crucial point is that during the war, what mattered most was that the Pope's public stand, the public stand is what mattered the most. And there is no doubt that his public silence was a help to the Nazis and a disaster for the Jews. Still, it is wrong to say that because of the Pope's attitude, the Catholic Church in France did nothing to help the Jews. Bishop Raymond's secret help to the Abadis in the Marcel network was but one example of a senior Catholic church official following his own conscience rather than his pope. Archbishop Jules Saliège of, of uh, Toulouse and Cardinal Pierre Guerrier of Lyon made similar major contributions to saving Jews. And of course, local priests very often helped as well. So much for the three myths. After the war, the traumas for the Abadis turned to reuniting broken families if one parent or another relative survived, or to arranging foster care for the children if not. And the emotional weight of all this on Musa sent him in a, into a depression that took him years to surmount. But surmounted he did. For nearly 50 years after the war, Musa built a new life as a leading lit a theater critic in France. And Odette had a brilliant career in the National Health Service, first as a doctor and later as a senior administrator. They never had children of their own and refused for decades to talk about their clandestine work during the war for several reasons. It was too painful for them to look backward. They wanted to get on with their lives and look ahead. They didn't want thanks, they didn't want praise, they didn't want fame. They said they had done their duty and that was enough. Indeed, Musa wrote uh, three books after the war, one of which gained him a major French literary prize, but he never wrote one word about the Marcel Network. 
But shortly before they died in the 1990s, they sat for seven hours of videotaped interviews by a leading French historian, finally convinced that they had to speak out. It was an interesting time. The, the, the leader of the ultra-right-wing National Front Party of the day, Jean-Marie Le Pen, uh, had claimed that the Holocaust never existed. It was a fabrication. And Moussa and, uh, Moussa and Odette decided they wanted to set the record straight by testifying to what they had witnessed. In the end, despite manifest difficulties, the Abadi story is an uplifting tale of sacrifice, generosity, and survival. It is, it is as relevant in today's world as it was in Hitler's day. And Musa said it best himself in a speech at the French Senate in 1995. And I'd like to conclude giving him the last word with a brief passage from that speech. What is a hidden child, Musa asked. It is a child in danger. It is a child who needs help from others. It is a child who risks death. So I ask you, I beg of you, look around yourself. Think of the children of Rwanda, of Somalia, of the children on the sidewalks of Manila, of the children of Chernobyl, of the children of Sarajevo. Then do something. These are hidden children, and you owe it to them to do something. And if you don't have the means to do anything for them, then yell, scream. Don't accept that in this world, children can be killed a few hundred kilometers from your home. Musa Abadi always insisted that saving, in saving children, he had only done his duty. He did far more than that, of course. Do as I did he said in a lesson for all mankind. Thank you.